This is joint work with uh, Chris, uh, Maria Fitzpatrick, and my colleague Lars, who's in the back. Um, and we come from the Rockwell Foundation Research Unit in Copenhagen. Um, oh, it doesn't switch yet. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about alternatives to incarceration uh, and studies on that. Now, what we're interested here for this workshop is the detrimental consequences of uh, to children of parental incarceration. Um, and yesterday we had some very interesting talks about uh, what are the, the, the ways that we can target children of uh, incarcerated parents and also help parents become uh, better parents when they, when they leave prison um, and sort of alleviate these detrimental consequences of incarceration. Uh, but the, as I sort of, as my co-authors informed me, uh, the current state of affairs in the U.S. is also thinking about other ways uh, to punish offenders besides from sending them to prison. Um, so, sorry, I, I have to be sure. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the world might be changing. And, and the current focus in the U.S. might be other things than sending people to prison. Uh, and then the question becomes something else. So rather than thinking about how we can help children of incarcerated parents, it becomes rele relevant to understand how this sort of change of focus and the consequences of this change of focus, moving into, for instance, non-custodial sanctions, how that affects children. So understanding this sort of spillover effect of, of the change perspective um, is one important uh, thing that we need to address. And in addition, it also would be quite interesting and vital to understand um, compared to the consequences of the programs that we offer now uh, for the children of incarcerated parents, um, what's then the benefits or maybe the negative consequences of uh, providing non-custodial san sanctions or alternatives to these uh, sort of prison sentences. Um, so there are no current evaluations from the US on the effects of non-custodial sanctions and that reflect uh, three different elements. Um, first, the fact that when there have been changes in the US, um, or, uh, there's been implementations of new ways of, of san sanctioning prisoners, the new forms of doing this have become, uh, have become, uh, have been harsher uh, rather than more lenient uh, compared to what, what was usually the case. Obviously, it's still possible to, to sort of assess differences between those that are affected by previous and more lenient uh, types of sanctions compared to those that are affected by the harsher, um, but this has not been done. Um, and then I'm told that the spillover effects on the families are often not considered uh, to the extent that they are considered they are more often considered uh, in afterthought. Uh, and that ob obviously affect uh, data uh, issues and data quality. So we have little information or no information from the US on what are the consequences or the spillover effects on family members of alternative sanctions. Um, in Denmark, where Lars and I come from, uh, we've had multiple reforms that uh, changed the, the, the system and the use of sanctions. And a lot of these reforms have led to more lenient sanction forms. Uh, in particular, uh, we have increased the use of non-custodial sanctions quite massively uh, since the beginning of the 90s. Um, our contribution here, our chapter, will focus on two types of non-custodial sanctions, uh, the community service and electronic monitoring devices. I will talk more about this uh, later. But it occurred to me yesterday, when listening to all of your very interesting presentations and all the interesting debates, that Denmark is so different from a US context. Um, so I think it's important that I give you, provide you a bit of context for what it is that we're doing in Denmark uh, and what type of society these types of non-custodial sanctions uh, are used in. Now I know we've sort of been following the pres presidential election campaign on the sideline in Denmark and we know that, that there's been debates on the Scandinavian welfare state, uh, which we obviously also have in Denmark. And with this extensive welfare state, it means that poverty looks very different in Denmark compared to the US. We do have poor people, but, uh, but when a family uh, experiences poverty, there are so many different means uh, that can help them. Maybe not uh, escape poverty, but which can sort of alleviate the negative consequences. So it means that families that are exposed to, uh, to social events such as incarceration are less likely to experience a dramatic uh, sort of decrease in, in living standards. Um, so the welfare state is obvi obviously a very big difference between Denmark and the US. Then there's also uh, important ideological differences between our criminal justice systems. Um, we often talk to, uh, to, to uh, sort of various sort of actors in the prison system in Denmark, and it's quite clear uh, from their descriptions of the system that, that in Denmark we have a very, um, there's an important focus on, on making prison life, life as similar to 
everyday life outside of the bars as possible. So it's not meant, the prison sentence is not meant to be more than um, sort of the reduction of your, of your freedom. Um, you have to be able to uh, get education, to a certain extent work, um, and be in contact with your family while you're in prison. So it also means that prisons look very different in Denmark. Um, and I have to say also, I'm just using the word prison, but we don't have this, this, the distinction between jails and prison. Um, and I'm aware of the, this, the distinction here. Um, which I guess also makes sense uh, considering the sentence lengths in Denmark, where 95% of all sentences are shorter than a year. So it's dramatically different um, compared to the US. Also, an important concern when, when a, a prison sentence or a sanction is considered for an offender is uh, the offender's family situation. Um, how can we, we, we accommodate uh, the needs to be a part of a family and to somehow, to a certain extent, cater to your children's needs? So we have, it's, it's an entirely different system, and I think that's important to mention here. Uh, also, more specifically, um, there's a strong focus on, uh, on facilitating family contact during imprisonment. This means that uh, rather than having uh, visits uh, sort of between uh, or behind window, window screens or behind bars, uh, it's possible to actually have your family come into the prison and sit with them in a designated room. These rooms could be equipped with, or often equipped with toys, uh, access to outdoor playgrounds. Um, so they are meant to facilitate sort of as normal as possible an interaction between family members. Um, Chris and I went to see one of the, highest, the maximum security prisons in uh, Denmark uh, last summer and saw a family room, uh, which is not only a place where family can visit, but they can also stay overnight. Uh, so this looks like a small one-bedroom apartment um, that also has access to, to outdoor play, playground facilities and toys. Um, so obviously there's a lot of differences in how families meet uh, family members uh, that are imprisoned uh, in Denmark. Uh, a last important uh, element is that inmates may get permission to leave the prison to visit family uh, after a certain while in, in prison. So there are many sort of contact points between the inmates in Denmark and their family members, uh, which are also a big difference compared to the US setting. So that was the context. If, if there's more thing you need to clarify, please just ask or we can take that in the discussion. So the ambition of our chapter is to show um, Given that we have this prison system and given that we have this focus in Denmark to use non-custodial sanctions, uh, what are then the consequences uh, to the children or the family members of the, uh, the inmates um, of these alternative sanctions? Uh, so the first type of sanction that I'll be talking about is community service. Uh, and I know community service is also something that's used in a US context. In Denmark, we use it as uh, a replacement for a prison sentence, uh, a replacement for a prison sentence that's shorter than 18 months. And thinking about the number I gave you before with the 95% of all prison sentences being shorter than a year, uh, this is virtually everything. Uh, community, yeah? Can I just ask a question? Yes. I think it's important to note that even though the, the Denmark prison system is quite different, you still find negative effects for, for kids that with parents that are incarcerated. And I think that's yeah. an, it's an important thing to note before yeah. we move on to these things. So I would love yeah. to, like, could you just say a little bit about that before you talk about these alternatives? Yeah, I think. I think I'd actually want to get back to this uh, in my ending slide uh, because I think it's a really important point and it's also important for understanding how we, how we may use these results from the Danish context in a US context. So I think that's quite important, uh, an important element. Now the community service consists of between 30 and 300 hours of, uh, of, of work at a public way, uh, workplace, a uh, publicly supported workplace. This could be a library, a uh, home for the elderly, a thrift store, um, so any, anything you can imagine where it would be nice to have it, an extra set of hands. Uh, it's organized such that offenders uh, are allowed to continue their usual activities. So while you carry out your community service, you can go to work, uh, engage in sports activities, uh, go on uh, for birthdays, um, go to parties, do whatever you usually do. You just have to, um, to work these 30 to 300 hours of community service. Um, and as I said, it replaces a prison sentence that's shorter than 18 months, um, and it means that in principle all types of offences, uh, maybe uh, all, all offender types are eligible for, for community service. But some offence types, obviously if you, if you, if you commit a murder, um, you'll get more than 18 months of prison, even in, in Denmark. Um, so you'll have sentence lengths that are longer than the, the 18 months, and that would then rule out uh, the option to get community service. 
Uh, and then there's also the element that we discuss a lot in the Danish context, I'm sure it's the same in the US, that judges need to factor in the sense of public justice. So it wouldn't make sense to have a rapist do community service at the local library uh, where uh, the person might, be, might meet uh, the victims. So there are these sort of um, elements to it. Community service was first trialed in the beginning of the 80s, but wasn't really taken up by judges. Um, so this graph shows uh, the, the uptake rate for community service, and we'll see there's a large kink here, around uh, 2,000. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, there's something missing. Um, there was a reform here that, that uh, inspired judges to use community service as a sentence type uh, uh, more than they had done recently or previously. Uh, and it also sort of expanded the, the uh, reduced the lower bar for <laughs> the number of hours that uh, the community service could consist in. So some judges would say, if you only get a, a prison sentence of, say, 30 days, then we think that, um, okay, <laughs> that the number of, of community service that you have, hours of community service that you have to, 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 um, to do as a minimum would be too much. Uh, so they lowered the bar uh, for the number of hours, uh, and that meant that there was a large intake of as you will see here from the graph, uh, offenders of uh, drunk driving. Um, so based on the Danish register data, I think a lot of you have heard about this already. Um, there's been four uh, evaluations of community service in Denmark conducted. One is by uh, a fellow uh, criminologist in Denmark, and not one of our colleagues, uh, Christian Clement, who, who didn't use um, sort of any specific identification strategy to have a causal effect of uh, of a community service, but who just looked at uh, community, service and community service and compared them to, to relevant uh, reference groups. Uh, he looked at whether or not serving uh, a sentence uh, in community service rather than going to, to jail uh, reduced recidivism among offenders and found that uh, the CS uh, offenders uh, had significantly lower recidivism. Um, I conducted this study uh, that was published in 2015 uh, where I used the 2000 reform to facilis facilitate uh, exogenous variation in who got and who didn't get community service, um, and focused on labor market outcomes, wages, and unemployment, and recidivism, and found that those that got to serve in community service uh, had higher wage income and uh, lower, lower social benefit dependency, which is uh, an indicator of unemployment, uh, compared to those that went to prison. And I also found that specific groups of offenders had lower recidivism rates. Um, but what we're interested in here is obviously uh, family effects. So Chris and I have uh, done two studies using the same 2000 reform, um, slightly different empirical setups, but still identifying the causal effect of uh, community service on uh, outcomes. And the first study focusing on, focuses on the effect of a father's community service uh, on children's risk of experiencing foster care. Um, and we find that children of fathers who get community service are significantly less likely to experience foster care. And their risk is reduced by five percentage points, uh, which is uh, quite significant, I think would be also in a US context. Uh, Chris and I look at the uh, child charges uh, in another study uh, and find that children of fathers who get community service are significantly less likely to be charged with a criminal offense within one to 10 years uh, after their father has served uh, with community service. And the reduction is also 10 percentage points. Uh, these, these are significant effects. Uh, and crucially, this compares to these relatively, I mean, uh, compared to a US, and US uh, context, very lenient prison sentences that we have. Um. The other non-custodial sanctions, sanctions that we have focused on in our work are electronic monitoring, uh, which I also know you use in the US. But again, rather than using this as part of a probation um, or part of a, a prison sentence, we use this as a prison sentence, or we use it to, to replace a prison sentence uh, shorter than six months. Um, again, all offender types are eligible for uh, the use of electronic monitoring, uh, but some offender types, again, uh, get uh, offense types uh, result in prison sentences that are too long to be replaced uh, by electronic monitoring device, uh, given the six month rule. Um, and then eligibility also depends on uh, the, the offender complying with specific requirements regarding uh, having a, a, a stable, uh, having a house, a home, rather than being homeless, um, that uh, a spouse uh, or someone else that lives with the person consents to the, to the, the arrangement, and that he or she also has a, a sort of stable, relatively stable labor market, labor market affili affiliation. 
uh, and again, um, we'll say that there are some family elements taken into consideration in deciding whether or not the person could, uh, could serve with uh, electronic monitoring. And basically what's happening is you just get this GPS tracking device put on your ankle. Um, it's visible, but if you wear long pants, uh, no one sees it. And so you can more or less avoid the stigma of, uh, of, uh, of the sentence type. Um, and in addition to this, there will be a, a very strict schedule set out uh, for the offender that he or she has to follow. Uh, and, and sort of the, the schedule, is that, the schedule is that strict that, that you cannot be five minutes late. So say you go home from work on your bicycle and you get a flat tire, uh, that could end up being a violation of, of, uh, of, of the year monitoring. Uh, I think in other European countries, uh, this type of non-custodial sanction has been used since the 70s, but in Denmark we were quite late to take up, um, to take up EM. Uh, it wasn't until 2005 that the first, um, the first option to serve with electronic monitoring was, uh, was established. Um, and then we have had uh, sort of three or four reforms afterwards that expanded uh, the offender group that could serve with, uh, with electronic monitoring. And you'll see an increase here in, in the use of this type of, uh, of sanction. Um, the other graph shows uh, the use of prison. And you have to bear in mind then that this, this type of, of, uh, of sanction is installed after we've installed community service. So it, it addresses the offenders that are, that are left for prison uh, after we put a large group into community service. So this is likely to be a, a sort of a heavier group with more problems. Okay, so uh, there's been four evaluations again about uh, the effects of uh, electronic monitoring in Denmark. One by also a fellow criminologist that's uh, not a colleague at Rockwell, um, and another fellow criminologist uh, who's a PhD student. Um, and all have used sort of relatively strict designs uh, to facilitate causal inference uh, of the electronic monitoring device. Um, Tanya, the first study here, she focused on recidivism. Uh, and found borderline significantly low recidivism among drunk driving uh, that were allowed to serve with electronic monitoring devices. Uh, and also found lower recidivism, re recidivism rate uh, among young offenders. Um, Lars and I conducted a study uh, where we focused on a lower welfare dependency, uh, a welfare dependency among uh, young offenders and found that uh, serving with this, this device lowered, uh, lowered their risk of becoming unemployed. Um, Brit focused on education and looked at whether young offenders who served with EM were more likely, more or less likely to, to uh, pursue education and, and, uh, and get a degree um, and found that that was, in, was the case. Uh, and then Lars and our colleague Peter uh, focused on uh, the effects <laughs> of electronic monitoring um, on the uh, union dissolution rates and found also that, that uh, going to prison or getting the, the electronic monitoring device compared to going to prison, significantly lower the risk that, that uh, our offenders uh, split from their, from their partner. I know that the, maybe these studies are not that relevant to the topic that we're discussing here, but we all know that having a stable labor market affiliation, not pursuing further criminal careers, are crucial for how, um, thank you, for how uh, the effects of, of prisons will be. So what we see is, this is just to sum up, uh, there's some positive spillover effects on family members and children in particular, uh, when their fathers uh, serve with non-custodial sanctions. And these are only uh, numbers for fathers because in Denmark, very few women uh, go to prison. So that's why we focused on that. And then the question that you asked, and how is this relevant to a US context? Or can we think that this is relevant to a US context? And I think that could be the topic for a debate. Um, because we do have, as I said initially, the Danish welfare state and the very different uh, criminal justice systems. Uh, and on the one hand, you could think that uh, because we have this, these strong effects and significant effects in a setting where uh, the alternative is, is that much better compared to the US, that if we implemented these uh, types of sanctions in a US context, we would see even larger effects because the difference would be so, would be so large. On the other hand, we have some studies uh, from Rockwell um, where we compare the, it's not Lars and I unfortunately that did it, but where we compare the sort of what we call the informal uh, consequences of um, of crime or sentences in Denmark, and that have found that the informal consequ consequences of having served a sentence in Denmark are stronger compared to the US, probably because it's less common in Denmark. So, uh, so that could be things um, sort of drawing in both, both directions. So yeah, I'll leave that 
for you to consider whether or not we can use this. But I think, nevertheless, or regardless of the result of our discussion, I think this is very positive. Uh, there are positive implications of this that need to be considered. Okay, thank you. Okay, so you in the back. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk about the differences in recidivism rates between the U.S. and Denmark, and also you had mentioned that I think 95% of sentences in Denmark are less than 12 months, and mm -hmm. I was wondering whether the types of crimes committed in Denmark, like how different they are compared to the types of crimes committed in the U.S. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think the majority, I think I also need some help from my, <laughs> my colleague, but the majority of, of, of prisons, of sort of offense types in Denmark would be violent crimes, drug offenses, uh, property crime, which are very similar to what we'll see in the US. Um, I think there could be some types of sort of the severity of the crime that could differ simply because we have lower inequality, maybe less desperation, but um, to the extent that, that the crimes are committed by someone who are desperate because they need money for a drug abuse, they're likely to be as severe, and, and the characteristics of the offenders, um, for instance, their mental health issues, uh, could be similar to the to the U.S. and therefore also inspire the same type of severity in in the crimes. So, so I think this is not an indication necessarily of differences in severity, but of system system orientation, um, that we simply do not think that this is a, this that providing long prison sentences is the right way to to handle this problem. And I think when we meet people in the system judges and uh, prison wardens, uh, they are all quite ideological about uh, how to treat offenders. And that is, these are also victims that need to be helped uh, and moved further into, uh, sort of reintegrated into society and that no one could be interested in, in, uh, in having them sort of waste their lives in prisons. So with the recidivism rates, I hope that Klaas can help me, <laughs> or maybe Chris. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I think recidivism rates are actually quite comparable in, in, in the two contexts. Uh, offenders tend to be doing quite badly uh, after release, um, which is sort of a puzzle, right? Because we treat our offenders in, in such different ways. But I think one of the points probably leads back to what Sina was talking about, the informal punishment. That sort of being incarcerated in Denmark is just such a marker of bad personality that you sort of get stigmatized in all sorts of domains after the release. Um, but so just uh, a comment on the um, sort of the, the composition of the prison population. I think the composition of Sina set of inmates is probably quite similar in the two contexts. The composition of the uh, criminal market is sort of the landscape of criminality is quite different. Uh, so the States is a much more violent country than Denmark. De Denmark has had for I think like 15 years, we've had the world's highest burglary rate. Um, we just like three years ago dropped to second because the Dutch sort of took over the lead, but, um, but our, vi our rate of violent crimes is, is incredibly low, and we only have, like in Denmark, we have on average 40 um, murders a year, like 40, four zero, right? Um, which is like practically nothing. Um, so I think there's also, like, there's, there are great structural differences in the landscape of offenses, but not perhaps uh, in how we treat them, like how we punish those offenders. I have a really quick question, and forgive my ignorance, but um, I wanted to get a sense of kind of the demographic landscape of Denmark, because I get the sense that it's probably not as diverse racially, ethnically, as far as religion, and I think that has a huge um, impact on the way folks are criminalized in the country. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so we always talk, talk about ourselves as a tribe, so Danes have been Danes since the Vikings. Uh, but we've had quite a significant uh, degree of immigration um, over the last sort of 30 years. So first we had some, um, some Turks immigrating to work and we've also had our share of refugees. Um, uh, these are in general a homogeneous group to the extent that, uh, that they're all mainly Muslims. Um, but it's n not nearly as diverse as we see it in the US. And, and obviously that reduces friction um, which is an important sort of uh, um, source of conflict. Um, so it matters quite a lot. But I would say that, that there's a strong sort of, um, I think the Danish media are very focused on criminalizing the, the Muslim groups in Denmark. We have the same debates that uh, all European countries have and the same 
uh, types of, of uh, unjustified fears for, uh, for, for those that are different. And I think it, that's probably also arises from the fact that we are a tribe and we've been the same and together for thousands of years. Um, but I, I think it would be <laughs> an over-exaggeration to say that it's, it's somewhere near uh, what you experience in the US. So that makes a difference. Yeah. Thank you, this is just really fascinating. Um, recognizing how different the kind of the structures are, the conditions within the US, um, and what a paradigm shift this, you know, would be for the US. I, I'm wondering um, what, what kind of pushback um, did Denmark experience in terms of these changes? And then what were some of the strategies that were used? How was it kind of framed um, so that there was um, eventually buy-in? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of these changes toward non-custodial sanctions, ha sanctions have been um, choices of necessity, out of necessity, that we had an uh, overpopulation in prisons, so something needed to be done. And this was a flexible way to adjusting the system. Um, but I think it's important to also think that, uh, to know that, that judges and uh, people in the prison system are quite uh, ideological about this. That, that, that they as a group agree that it's not a good idea to always uh, increase sentences and being tougher on crime. Uh, we do have uh, uh, occasionally prime uh, uh, ministers of justice that always want to increase uh, punishment and sentence length, um, and it happens. So it's not that we're always doing, uh, making the system more lenient, um, but that will be met by a strong opposition in the system, um, simply because the ide ideology is different in the system. So we have some, some so strong and active people there that, uh, that work against it, and also to really do their best to try to promote um, more lenient punishments. That was really interesting, and I actually was thinking back to some of the conversation yesterday about the ambiguity in the process in the United States and how that causes, that's, that could be one of the places where there's um, the negative impacts in the U.S. of incarceration are coming from on families and children. And I was wondering, um, in the literature that you reviewed, a lot of that was about kind of um, identification strategies that um, get close to a causal estimate of the effect, but I was wondering if you could comment at all on the mechanisms of why these particular interventions or alternatives to incarceration may have these positive spillover effects relative to incarceration of the parents, um, and w maybe giving us a peek as to whether the lower levels of ambiguity required for this kind of structured um, response might be part of why we see a more positive effect, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. So I think what when we have reform studies, there could be, we know what exactly what happens, so we know that that, that the only difference we see between the two groups, uh, those that get prison and those that don't, is the fact that uh, one group is eligible for this uh, due to a, an exogenous shock um, and not because of their individual characteristics. So we know that they get, it's not about how the arrest is, how the, um, how the sentence, sentencing, sentencing process goes. It is the mere fact that one group gets a community service and one, good, one, one group goes to prison. So we know that, that the effect or the origin of the, the effect is confined to uh, sentence type simply. Um, so that's where we could start look, uh, look at me mechanisms. But I think Chris and I did um, some, made some efforts to try to disentangle. See, is, is it because of uh, financial issues in the family? Uh, is it because, I don't know, less uh, union dissolution? Um, but with the registers that we use, it's difficult to get more closely to the mechanisms. So we are, we're still not at a stage where it's possible to, to, uh, to, see, to say exactly why it is that these things work this, this way. Because you could think of, of, of two sort of opposing processes. Uh, one is that you have this, uh, this father that's home rather than going to prison and that's more present. But another is that you have a father that might that could be likely to exert a negative influence on a child. Um, from qualitative studies, we know that, that serving with uh, electronic monitoring devices is quite stressful. The fact that you have to follow this, comply with this schedule, that precisely can cause additional stress. And it, I mean, can you imagine that, that this father that's small is sort of confined to his own home and not being able to go out and drink a beer with his friends, that he can get quite fr frustrated at times during, his, uh, uh, during the time that he serves with electronic monitoring. So we're not at that stage yet where we can see uh, or can say what are the mechanisms, unfortunately. And that is also important for how we should think, how we should think of this in a US context. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
So I'm curious, um, with the studies you mentioned, uh, within the study, is, uh, were there differences in terms of the strength of the effects of um, the uh, uh, community service or uh, electronic monitoring um, for the Muslim populations that you mentioned as being the minority populations? Yeah, so for the community service uh, studies, we actually exclude immigrants uh, because they caused some disturbance, just disturbance that we couldn't explain across the reform time, uh, at the time of the reform. So we excluded the Muslims, uh, or the immigrants. Um, we didn't look specifically at immigrant, uh, immigrants for the electronic monitoring studies mm -hmm. because our group ended up being that small um, that, that it wasn't uh, statistically uh, sort of feasible to, to go, that route, go to that route. Um, but that obviously, that's, that's a really important question. Um, we know that, that our, our immigrant population tend to have uh, different crime age profiles in Denmark compared to the Danes, so they tend to age out earlier. Um, and so in general, they have a different behavior in the system that would be very interesting to, to uh, know more about. Yeah. Uh. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of stigma Yes. And whether you think these different sanctions affect the stigma attached to being a, like yeah. an offender? So, so uh, stigma is obviously, obviously one of the important explanations for the effects of prison sentences. But it could also be something that produces a positive effect of community service or electronic monitoring. So you are at the library. Everyone wonder why you're doing what, what, what you're doing there. Would ask why are you here for these three months? Uh, you have to say I'm here to serve a prison a sentence. Uh, so th it's quite obvious that you are part of something that uh, is a signal of uh, that you've done something bad. But again, we we, we are not able to distinguish uh, the stigma explanation from this. What we can say is that on average, whatever mechanisms that drive this, on average, uh, community service electronic monitoring improves the outcomes of the offenders, and that's probably a reflection of a combination of mechanisms including the stigma uh, mechanism. I saw a hand here. Yes. In, implicit in all of this, and I think you may have also have stated it, is that there needs to be a lot of time taken in terms of assessing what is appropriate and, and um, as compared to mandatory sentences like we have in the United States where regardless of, of what the circumstances were or the individual, if you're guilty, you get this number of years kind of. of. Can you speak more to um, like the judicial time and expense that goes into implementing this mm. kind of a, a system? Yeah, so in, in general, most offenders are assessed, or the background characteristics are assessed before going to court. So, so there's a screening process uh, that precedes uh, the day at the court, uh, where, where all their sort of personal, uh, the whole personal situation is assessed. Um, and that's for, I think Lars actually had the numbers yesterday, but it's a large majority of all offenders, regardless of, of of whether they, where they end up going. So there's some effort put into this, um, even for a, a large group of offenders that you do not expect to get these non-custodial sanctions. So it's part of the system already that the, the offenders are assessed. So the, it's, it doesn't cost that much extra. I'm sure the assessment is also, has been increased since, uh, since this, um, this type, these options were, were, were implemented. But we know still that, that serving with electronic monitoring devices is so much cheaper than going to prison, that even if there's a lot of resources going into this this, this work before the, the, the day after the, the, the offender goes to court, it's still significantly cheaper than sending someone off to prison. And, and, and even in addition, cons considering also the positive consequences that these non-custodial sanctions have uh, for future labor market outcomes, uh, child outcomes, in addition, et cetera. I mean, it's all worth it. Um, I think Lars has a, wants to supplement here. Thanks. Um, so one of the, so th as Sina says, these, these sort of these uh, screenings have been done like that's what we've always been doing, even to to people who are going to actually serve time in prison. Because I think a pretty important difference between the, the states and Denmark is also that, uh, like Sina said, we we try to take like the, the the family as a unit into account when sanctioning people. So we actually have these screenings even for people we expect to go to prison because we will want to make sure that we place um, prisoners with kids as close to home as possible. So you're always, so if you have a family, you're always assigned to the facility that is uh, closest to your loved ones and to your family to ease sort of the contact, like the visitation uh, driven contact um, between the family members. 
Oh, sorry. Just real quick, so could you tell us a little bit about the drug laws in Denmark and how they might differ from our drug laws here? Uh. <laughs> so, for example, in my state of Oregon, marijuana is now legal, but it's still uh, legal yeah. to use in certain contexts, but it's still a federal crime. So there's a conflict there, but the feds aren't enforcing it except in certain circumstances right now. But yeah. do you have other drugs in Denmark that are legal to use? So in, in other words, what would a drug offender in Denmark be like? Okay, I think last year. <laughs> Thanks, that's my domain again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so um, in Denmark, we have a very strict distinction between possession and sale. So sale would almost always send you to prison but possession would almost always give you a fine. So you're not, uh, we're not imprisoning drug addicts, essentially. That's sort of the, the, the main difference. We view these, these guys as more sort of the victims of the um, more bad drug dealing guys. Um, so one of the things that we do for the drug addicts, uh, once we're punishing them, is for, for a bunch of them actually, um, like repeat drug offenders, instead of just keep on fining them, I mean, they have no money, instead of keep on fining them, uh, we then sort of um, give them probation with like special conditions of treatment. So we have like a, a very, very um, large package of treatment possibilities for, uh, for drug um, addiction, but also for, um, for other types of problems like mental health problems. You can get that as a sort of a condition for uh, probation to um, and anger management for like um, the most um, what do you call it? It's like the most uh, common uh, violent offenders and stuff like that. And even also for drunk drivers, rather than going to prison, they get a treatment program. So so there's a lot of ways of of trying to sort of handle this differently. I, I just wanted to know if um hi oh, sorry <laughs> no worries um so have has does our U.S. government want to listen to any of this evidence uh, I mean <laughs> like has there been any effort to sort of show these studies and say should we implement anything whether at the state level uh, one state potentially can I mean what are like thinking about how do we extend this to the United States. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? I think there's a main obstacle, one big obstacle that, I mean, how would you convince people that uh, replacing 30 years of prison with community service is fair? I mean, it seems that since the system in, US, in the US, so you have so long prison sentences, that, that uh, I think you would have to have a, make a very strong case to convince people that, that, that they should get community service instead. I mean, what does, what does that, What's that equal to in, in community service, 30 years of prison? So I think there will be some sort of structural things that, that needed to be dealt with before this can be, uh, this can be accommodated into the US system. And we haven't, we haven't sort of addressed, we haven't talked to the US government about this, I think. Uh, yeah. So in the US we have um, drug courts and we do use electronic monitoring. So I don't know if you're in your review, and I apologize if I missed it, have there been outcome studies published? Because these have been considered here, and would they be, um, or did you come across them, or do other people in the room know about you know, outcome studies associated with drug courts or uh, jail diversion programs or electronic monitoring systems? And not to my knowledge. Um, but maybe someone else knows. So I don't know the answer to that question, but that's exactly the question I was thinking about. And it comes back to something that was discussed earlier um, yesterday's session about the, the process in which we see families moving through the criminal justice system in this country. Um, and I think as family scholars and child developmentalists, I don't think that we've done a very good job of understanding families' roles in those parts of the process. We certainly know that there's a lot of variability even with mandatory minimums and particularly with l lower level offenses where we might see individuals go to, to jail for you know less than a year and a day or even to prison for, for relatively short prison sentences. We still know that there's considerable variability in the way judges sentence mm -hmm. and what I don't think we have a good understanding of yet is how judges are taking into account 
children and families and what that variability looks like. And to Danielle's point, you know, we do use community service and electronic home monitoring and drug court and other models, but to the best of my knowledge, and I'd love to hear if people in this audience know more, we haven't really connected that to child and family outcomes. So for those families who get electronic, for those individuals who get electronic mo home monitoring, what are the outcomes for their children? And does that impact their labor participation or their ability to maintain their housing? And therefore, what are the implications for their children? And I'm not aware uh, that we've really tapped into those questions, which I think is an important area for next steps. So I'm not gonna answer that question. <laughs> but um, you know, I was sitting here thinking, this is such a great model, and why doesn't the United States look at it? But there's a big elephant in the room, institutional oppression, right? It's very easy to be lenient when everybody looks like you, when you think that this is your tribe and you're taking care of your own. But when you have other people who look different, who have different ethnicity, who have different religious traditions, it's very difficult to see yourself in them and say that I wanna be lenient, I wanna make sure that they're taking care of their family. So. It's just a different context. I think it makes sense, but would that translate to the United States as far as our demographic, um, given the diversity and given the way that institutional oppression is so ingrained in our society? I think that's, that's a, a very good point. And uh, I mean, it's easy for me to have, <laughs> to present this from my type of country that's very different from the US, but, but we have had strong debates in Denmark as well, also about, uh, whether or not this is a pro an appropriate way of sentencing people. And, and I think it all comes down to whether or not we, we want a better society on average, not only for our own tribe, because the fact that we have someone who recidivates more <coughs> frequently because they get harsher prison sentences is something that none of us are interested in. Uh, we want the contribution from, the, from those that are now more able to work because they didn't go to prison. And I think that should be the focus of the debate rather than who it is that's being sentenced. It's, it's what is the, the long-term outcomes of this that will benefit all of us, regardless of their ethnicity or uh, religion or what other types of, of, sort of <laughs> differences there could be. So I, I think it's a, it's a matter of focus, and it's just to say that we had the same debate in Denmark. Uh, there was this very specific sort of prison in, in, uh, intervention where this famous chef wanted to, to help inmates uh, uh, be trained as chefs so that they could work as chefs afterwards. And one of the participants had, had sort of severely molested his girlfriend uh, to the extent that she was almost dead. And she, she then took part in the debate and said, I, this is not fair that this guy who almost killed me is now being given all this positive attention. Um, and that, insp that created a huge debate uh, about this, this, uh, this particular prison, uh, prison incident. So, so we have it in Denmark too. So I have to transition us to the next presentation. Yes. But I did want to say to your, to your point, um, I mean, I, I think 20 years ago that argument applied a lot better than it does now. When, when you have organizations like Right on Crime who are focusing on these sort of low-hanging fruit kind of offenders, and there's a lot of enthusiasm for significantly decreasing the incarceration rate in the US. I think the, I think the, the issues of racial differences and regional differences and those sorts of things are things that we can skirt until we start really seriously talking about violent offenders. And then I think it's gonna be a, I, I think the things that you're concerned about are really gonna, really gonna come into play there. But I mean, I think if you're focusing on nonviolent drug offenders for these sorts of diversion programs in the US, I think we have a pretty unique opportunity for, for those being taken seriously. So 